Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. I want to give a quick shout out to my sponsors at Blue Chew. If you need a little bit of extra confidence in the bedroom, Blue Chew is here for you. No doctor's visits, no waiting in line at the pharmacy. Everything is online at bluechew.com. Use code Holly to try your first prescription for free. All right. I want to introduce my guest today. If you're kinky and your partner is vanilla or vice versa, today's guest is one you're going to want to listen to. She's a certified sex therapist and social worker who specializes in gender, sexuality, and relationships. And she's the author of With Sprinkles on Top, Everything Vanilla People and Their Kinky Partner Need to Know to Communicate, Explore, and Connect. Welcome, Stephanie Gorlick. Hi, Stephanie. How are you? Great. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to have you here today. So, Stephanie, let's, I guess, start from the beginning. Um, you started as a social worker before shifting to sex therapy. How did your career start in social work? Uh, well, I spent the majority of my career actually working with survivors of domestic and sexual assault and other traumas, uh, including you know pediatric survivors. I worked with uh, survivors of human trafficking. Really, my my early career was working with people who'd had their bodies and their relationships and their sexualities weaponized against them. And so when I was looking to move into private practice, it made perfect sense from a clinical perspective to kind of flip that coin and to focus on the other side of those same issues of helping people have stronger, happier, healthier relationships with their bodies, with their partners, with themselves. And so I did my postgraduate training in sex therapy, and I have been doing that ever since. And where did the inspiration come for your new book uh, with sprinkles on top? Uh, as you mentioned, I specialize in working with gender, sexuality, and relationship uh, diversities, in, in, which includes a lot of non-monogamous people, a lot of kinky people. And what I was noticing was that the majority of couples who were coming to me for counseling were coming because of desire differences, not necessarily frequency, what we think about as libido, right? They want sex more than I do. But um, desire, what they want when we have sex is different than what I want. And there wasn't a lot out there for those couples. And so I wrote Sprinkles. Yeah. I mean, I will say that, you know, I get a lot, 96% of my audience are, are men and I get a lot of listener mail talking about, you know, how they have this kind of secret with like watching pornography and watching my show and, you know, their wives don't know and they want to try this and their wives don't want to try that and they don't like sex and how can they talk to their wives about that kind of thing? Is that, is that commonly what you see that with? Do you usually have more men coming to you with communication issues or is it more women or is it a mix of both? You know, it's a mix of both. It's, it's people coming because they're holding secret some part of themselves that they don't feel comfortable sharing with their partner. And then also I have spouses who reach out to me and say, I've found something about my partner, either something that, you know, they were brave enough to tell me or often, you know, things that I discovered. I stumbled across their toy stash under the bed. I found an open browser on the laptop. And all of a sudden I realized there's another entire part of my spouse that I didn't know about. And I don't know what to do with this information. So it's about an even mix between people that are wanting to have conversations with their partners about their authentic desires of their sexuality. And people who maybe didn't have the chance to have those conversations and now are struggling to wrap their heads around what does this mean? Right. At the very beginning of your book, you kind of, you start off by, by talking about how people often come into your office and like the first thing that they want to say, this disclaimer is I promise you, I'm not a pervert. And you say, um, you know, when the conversations happen, I ask the person sitting across from me what the word pervert means to them. Their answers are remarkably consistent. They tell me they are not a creepy guy lurking in the bushes, predator, weirdo into messed up sex, child molester, freak, sinner, some broken creature with fucked up fantasies. And then you go on to say, and you know what? I have never met someone who meets the criteria for perversion that they describe when I ask. So who are these people who find themselves in my office talking about their secret fantasies and sexual behaviors? Why do you think that people have to jump to that disclaimer, like first thing when they meet you? Like, what does that say about what people are so fearful of? 
we are given a very rigid, very kind of cookie cutter idea of what sexuality and relationships are supposed to look like in our society. Um, sex ed and, and the picture that we are taught about what normal quote unquote sex looks like does not include a lot of kink or power exchange or fetish play or any number of the things that really make up the full spectrum of sexuality. And so Whenever something deviates from the norm, you know, we're talking statistics class, right? Mathematical deviation. We think of deviation as deviancy. And deviancy tends to get equated with perversion. It becomes not no longer a mathematical statement of, oh, I'm slightly to the left of the statistical norm, the average. Now it becomes a, because I'm not average, that is a moral failing on my part. It says something about me, who I am as a person. And so right. being able to have my clients tell me what they want and the joy and the happiness and the connection and the stronger relationships that these experiences give to them. And to be able to hear somebody say, that makes perfect sense. I completely understand why you would want that. I, I see the value it brings to your life. And that's a lovely thing, can be incredibly validating. Right. You go on to talk about how the media tends to portray kinky folks in one of two ways, dangerous predators or the butt of jokes. Rarely are they portrayed as happy, healthy people with well-rounded lives and fulfilling relationships. And then uh, that multiple studies show kinky people tend to be just as mentally healthy as their vanilla peers. Um, I was in a kinky relationship a uh, long time ago with a, with a guy who was definitely, you know, one of those well-balanced, well-educated, you know, mentally stable people. And, you know, it didn't work out for us because he wanted to kind of push things further than I was willing to do. But the one thing that I noticed about our relationship that was something I had never experienced with anybody else was actually this communication like how much he wanted to communicate about sex and how clear he wanted to be about like the play that he wanted to engage with to the point where I remember him giving me a boundary checklist, which at the time, you know, this is like 10 years ago, I was just like, what on earth is this thing? And it's funny because we actually use boundary checklists in adult films now. We only kind of just started doing that after COVID. Um, I know it's been a, a common practice in like BDSM movies for a while, but that was really interesting to me, but also uncomfortable for me because the idea of having such an explicit conversation about sex felt kind of foreign, even though I grew up kind of around the adult industry. So what have you noticed about kinky people and their relationships? Do you find that people who freely engage in kinky relationships tend to have better communication skills? Absolutely. And, and there's research that backs that up. Uh, multiple studies have shown that uh, the BDSM community tends to have a higher consent culture than the, the mainstream general population because the expectation is this idea of ongoing reaffirmed consent. It is we're going to talk about what you want and what I want before we do anything. I'm going to do only the things that you told me that you want, and I'm going to continually check in with you throughout that moment and that experience to make sure that you still want what you want and that I'm doing it the way that you want it. And that is not a, a communications practice that we are taught in, in everyday American life. We're not taught that in most areas of life, even outside of the bedroom. You know, when we think about friendships and negotiating, what do you want to do when we hang out? Holly, we don't say, okay, I know you said you wanted to go to the mall, but are you still enjoying the mall? Are you having a good time? Are we making good conversation? Do we want to change things up? Should we go and do something else? We're not taught to think about consent that way. And kinky people really are, and they do. And because it's a core value of what it means to be an ethical kinkster, that tends to naturally bleed over into other areas of their relationship as well. And the result is typically a much stronger, much more aligned relationship between the people who are connected to one another. You also talk about your experience going through the sexual attitudes reassessment as part of your sex therapy training. Can you talk about the eye-opening experience about attitudes towards BDSM that you had during that? 
Yeah, so it, the, the the sexual attitudes reassessment process, it's called a SAR for short, is one of the first steps in becoming a sex therapist. When you start your sex therapy education journey, you are required to participate in a SAR. And the purpose is to be exposed to different kinds of relationships, different kinds of people, different kinds of erotic material, and to sit with how those things make you feel, good, bad, or indifferent. And I attended a school that is um, incredibly highly regarded for sex therapy. It's considered a progressive school. Obviously, everybody in my training group is a fully licensed medical or mental health provider already, so they should know what they're doing. They've chosen to go into sex therapy, so theoretically, they've self-selected into comfort with this topic. And we're watching, you know, videos of elderly couples that can't have penetrative sex anymore, but they're touching each other and they're holding each other and they're caressing. And I'm listening to the people around me say, oh, that's so beautiful. Oh, that's so brave. I hope my partner and I are like that when we are old. And we're watching um, videos of people with physical disabilities who use sex workers in order to access pleasure and to find um, enjoyment and, and excitement in their lives. And people are saying, oh, that's amazing. That's so brave. That's so cool. That's so inclusive and eye-opening. And then we get to the, I think, 90 minutes that we got on BDSM and kink and the whole energy in the room changed and it got very whispery and it got very giggly and people were making jokes and making comments. And all of a sudden, any sort of notion of respect or normalization went out the window. And hmm. because I'm a social worker by background, I'm not okay with that. And my first book, which was written about BDSM and mental health for other clinicians, I actually started writing the week after completing my SAR. I was writing that book as I was going through my sex therapy training because it became so abundantly clear that even within this world of experts and professionals in mental health and medical, the medical world and sexuality and relationships there's still a lot of stigma and there's still a lot of judgment and there's still a lot of shame. And that was heartbreaking to me. And so it very quickly, you know, became apparent to me that my job, my role, my personal purpose is to educate my peers to make sure that they're not causing harm to our clients, that they're not perpetuating stigma and hurting people and leaving them feeling broken or perverted. Right. I had Dr. David Lay on a while ago, and I remember him telling me that in order to complete therapy training, I think, and I could be completely wrong about this time, but I think it was something like you only needed two hours on like human sexuality or like, is that, is that true? Something along those lines? Um, the entire program is human sexuality, but human sexuality breaks down into a lot of different content areas. So, mm -hmm. you know, we might be talking about human sexuality in the context of aging versus human sexuality in the context of teaching children about sex versus um, problematic sexual behaviors like um, people who are attracted to children, that sort of thing. So mm -hmm. we get about a year plus of sexuality training. But within that, we're only really required to have about two hours specifically on BDSM and kink. Okay. Okay. So another thing that you touched on, and I don't know if this is kind of deviating from our conversation a little bit too much, but you mentioned it in passing, and this is something that we've talked about on this podcast before. And actually from starting this podcast and having conversations with people became something that I had never thought about. And I realized so many other people never think about. So you mentioned about people with disabilities hiring sex workers for intimacy. And, you know, like, obviously I consider myself a progressive person. I've worked in the adult industry for a long time. Um, but, you know, I didn't know that much about in-person sex work until I started doing this podcast and talking to people who are willing to even be open about doing it. There's still a lot of stigma around that and a lot of people who, who choose not to talk about it. And one of the first um, escorts that I had on was uh, Amy Taylor, and she was fantastic. And I remember her just being so open about, you know, um, her profession and so articulate and so 
interesting. And I had one of my Patreon members write to me and he told me that he was a man with disabilities who hired sex workers. And he said, you know, the one thing that people don't understand, you hear, you know, people criticize guys who hire, you know, full service sex workers, you know, saying like, oh, you should just get a girlfriend and, you know, like, how, how could you hire a hooker or a prostitute or, you know, whatever terminology they want to use. And he was like, you know, people forget about those of us who would have a very difficult time in the dating pool. It's hard enough for people to meet people in general, but when you come into, you know, a hopeful dating situation in a wheelchair or, you know, with some kind of even um, like sensory processing disorder. Alice Little talked about working with a lot of guys with autism when I had her on my program. And he said, you know, the only time that I've been successful in having an intimate connection with a woman is when I've hired a sex worker. And he was like, what am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to just never feel the touch of a woman, never be intimate with another human being? He's like, I would love to meet somebody who accept me for who I am and, you know, would date me and have a relationship with me, but I've been unsuccessful in this part. And so I hire sex workers who help me fulfill that need. And, you know, I've developed some great relationships with them. So that to me was like so interesting. And I feel like we don't think about that. You know, we don't think about the people who have a really hard time dating and meeting women. So I guess I just wanted to get your opinion on that specifically. I spent my spring in Europe. Um, I was there for almost two months. And one of the things that my partner and I did was hire a private guide to take us on a tour of the red light district in Amsterdam. And I know when people think about that, especially from a touristy perspective, you know, they think about the sex shows and they think about the porn shops and obviously, you know, the windows and all of that. But what was most remarkable to me was that there is a kindergarten, a preschool in the red light district. And it's not like a special preschool for the children of sex workers. It's a, my mom works two blocks over and she's dropping me off on her way to the office preschool. And literally on either side of it are windows with sex workers standing in the windows. And that to me was so remarkable because it's such a cultural difference in the normalization of how people should be thinking about accessing sex or affection or touch or a lot of things um, on a sort of payment basis that the fact that you don't want to take your children, you know, walking touristy through the red light district, but that the people that live in Amsterdam will drop their children off, wave to the sex workers on their way in and out and go about their day is a tremendous cultural difference. And I don't think we think about that a lot. And that to me should be how we carry over this conversation in the U.S. too. I have had um, consultations with people who don't want to have sex with sex workers, but they want to watch them smoke a cigarette. They want to watch them uh, walk barefoot back and forth across the hotel hallway. Any number of things that are incredibly arousing for them that we would look at and go like, why won't your girlfriend do that for you? What's the big deal? Why won't your wife just let you watch her smoke a cigarette? And in a lot of the couples that I work with, the discomfort comes from the fact that that's been sexualized. That if all you wanted was that you were okay with a wife who smoked, it wouldn't be an issue. But because I know you're sexualizing my smoking, now I feel uncomfortable. And mm -hmm. so having a resource where people can have those needs met without embarrassment or shame or stigma, and where we can understand that connection and touch with or without sexual penetration, but touch is an evolutionary imperative. When psychologists in the 50s and 60s did experiments with um, baby monkeys to learn about attachment, baby monkeys would choose touch over food. They would choose warmth and softness and connection over nutrition and health. We are wired for connection. And when people, for any number of reasons, can't access that, it impacts us on a very, very deep physiological level. And I think that if people here were able to understand the biological, physiological importance of touch and connection, that that perhaps might let us recontextualize our understanding of sex work and to look at it more as, um, I mean, we already consider it a service, but to think of it almost more as a healthcare service or a mental healthcare service, that it's not this 
you know, dirty, shameful thing people are doing, which is how Americans tend to think about most things sexual anyway, <laughs> but that it That's is true. genuinely meeting an emotional need that is important for people's mental and physical health, regardless of their ability level, but especially for those who experience barriers to forming those relationships more organically, like in dating. Yeah. Yeah. God, that's so true. You did an unofficial survey of 200 people in the BDSM community and found that roughly one in four engaged in kinky play every single day. Can you explain what like everyday kinkiness might look for a BDSM person or couple? Sure. Uh, a lot of kink is not necessarily sexual play. Uh, one of the problems with the pop culture portrayals of kink is that we tend to only see it in an explicitly erotic or sexual context. But for a lot of kinky people, especially those that enjoy power exchange, it's a relationship style. It's a way of building and maintaining their connection to one another. So everyday kink can look like um, a wife picking out her husband's tie every day because that is a subtle way that he will be reminded throughout the entire day that she owns him. It might be one partner serving dinner to the other partner and then waiting to pick up their fork until the person that was served starts eating first because that is their way of showing deference and a power differential. Um, it might just be, like I said earlier, the smoking of a cigarette and knowing that that's turning your partner on in a way that it might not for you, but it makes them happy. There are a million different ways that kinky people weave elements of various forms of kink and power exchange throughout their day that the average person even hanging out in their living room wouldn't necessarily notice. A lot of people that I've spoken to in the BDSM community stress that despite you know, public perception um, that the dom is the one who holds all the power. They say that the submissive is the one who actually holds all the power. Could you explain what that might mean? So that's a contentious statement, I think, in the kink world, because I know just, I, I know kinky people who say that. I know just as many people, especially on the submissive side, they get really frustrated with that because mm. the idea that they're the one that secretly holds the power is antithetical to what they want as a submissive. They want to give that up. <laughs> the best, the best answer to that that I have ever found actually comes um, from Janet Hardy and Dossie Easton. Uh, Janet Hardy wrote The Ethical Slut. And together, she and Dossie Easton have written several books of the years, written, not written, I apologize. <laughs> but one of them is uh, the New Bottoming book. And in the New Bottoming book, they talk about the idea of power exchange, especially, you know, differentiating it from abuse. And they say that the idea behind power exchange is that somebody has to have power in order to give it up. Mm. that in an abusive situation, you don't have power. You can't stop it. You can't control it. They don't want feedback on how they're treating you. But in a power exchange relation, the submissive person has power. They have personal authority. They have their own autonomy, their own agency, and they are choosing to give that over to their partner. And that, I think, is the most accurate description I've ever heard. It's not that the submissive person is secretly the one in control, which I think a lot of my DS couples find very uncomfortable. The submissive wants their dominant to be in control and the dominant is not necessarily okay with the idea that they're just being patted on the head and led to believe that they hold authority. They do. Here you go, here's a whip, go ahead. <laughs> exactly. <Good boy. laughs> so, I mean, from an, from an outside perspective, if we're trying to explain that power exchange in a way that feels safe for vanilla people, I can understand why folks say what they do. But mm -hmm. the more accurate answer is that both partners hold power in the relationship and the submissive is choosing to give some of theirs over to their dominant. I've also spoken to a lot of people who, you know, doms who say that a lot of their clients who choose to be submissive are often people who hold, you know, powerful positions in everyday society, CEOs, presidents, et cetera, stuff like that, politicians. Why do you think that people who are such powerful people in their everyday life would choose to flip the switch in their sexual lives? See, this is what's really interesting because I've heard those same um, sort of anecdotal reports from pro-doms. And it's interesting to me academically because that doesn't actually align with the research. 
And I think that there, there might be a difference between the people who visit professional doms versus the people that practice kink in their everyday lives. Because when researchers have studied the kink community, they have found that people that are dominant tend to be dominant across all their life domains. And people that are submissive tend to feel submissive across all of their life domains. The idea that you know the powerful CEO is the one most likely to be submissive in other areas is a really popular pop culture trope again. And it's one that we hear a lot about when we're talking to professional kinksters who are getting paid for their service. And that makes sense to me because they are perhaps seeing a population that's choosing a specific moment, a specific experience for a specific cathartic reason. But I suspect that those same clients are not necessarily going home and having their partner as their authority holder in other aspects of their relationship. I think that those anecdotal stories versus sort of where the what the researchers find is more showing us a difference in uh, the kink community, the kink consumer versus the kink lifestyler. Mm. Um, but that's just sort of where my head's been at as I've parsed out the various research over my books and my projects, because I don't know that I can say that there's um, been studies that will back up my theory, but that that's where I'm at on it. Because it is really interesting that the research consistently disproves the much more commonly heard anecdotal stories like you just shared. I wonder if it's true also that these, you know, powerful people are the kind of people who can afford to hire a pro dom to fulfill those fantasies, right? Whereas, you know, somebody who wasn't holding such a powerful position that earned them so much money wouldn't be in, you know, an economically viable situation to hire a sex worker. That's another really great explanation. And that's part of why I find the the sort of sociological research and the psychological research side of kink so fascinating, because there are so many myths and misconceptions around this community that because we hear enough anecdotes, we accept as truth. And when that happens in my world as a clinician, that can be really problematic because that leads my colleagues to think that they know who their clients are before their clients ever have a chance to tell them about their lives and their experiences. Yeah, that's a really good point. All right, guys, we're going to take a quick commercial break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about are you vanilla and your partner is kinky or vice versa? How do you deal with that situation? So stick around. I'll see you in just a minute. We all know Adam and Eve is the one-stop shop for everything sexy. And now with my code Holly, you can get any one item for 50% off plus 10 free gifts. And you'll even get free shipping. So spice up your sex life at adamandeve.com, but only if you use code Holly. Hey guys, welcome back. Okay, so Stephanie, um, what do you say to clients of yours who are worried that they are too vanilla for their kinky partner? So prior to COVID, I, I still had a bricks and mortar office and I used to keep the King Arthur cookie cookbook in my office right next to the DSM. And whenever somebody w- was talking about their vanilla identity and usually, honestly, it was as shame filled as their kinky partners were. The kinky partner is coming to me with so much shame because they can't be more quote unquote normal and their partner is upset about what they want. And then the vanilla partners are feeling incredibly embarrassed and ashamed that they're just so boring and bland and normal and that they can't be more adventurous the way their partner wants. And a lot of it is cultural again, as much as we, you know, give the the problematic labels to kinky people, it's not exactly like we're going yay vanilla, right? Like we, (laughs) we want everybody to be cookie cutter normal, but then we call them vanilla and boring. And so I, I would give my vanilla clients the cookie cookbook and I would challenge them to find any recipe in it that didn't need vanilla. And we would start by talking about what we mean when we talk about vanilla in relationships. And for me, that means trust and communication and mutual regard and love and affection. And all of these things that frankly are the foundation of any good relationship, no matter how kiki it might be. Everything starts with vanilla and then we build on top of that. And so that was always... I mean, it's still a conversation that I have. I don't get to put the cookbook in their hands anymore. But that to me is really important. And when I have couples come in because one person is kinky and their partner is not, 
they're often very surprised that I don't start by focusing on the kink. That my approach to working with these couples is to really start by centering the vanilla person. Because we're not given a lot of space in our society to really think deeply about our sexuality and our desires and our fantasies and what turns us on. We're not taught how to do that. We're not given a language for it, which is part of why those conversations that you were describing earlier feel so awkward for people. And so with my couples, I tell them, like, don't worry about the kink right now. Don't worry about what it might mean about them. Don't worry about what you feel like you have to do about it. I want to start with you as the vanilla person. And I want to really, really dig deeply into what do you want? What do you desire? What do you think about when you fantasize? And really getting a very clear picture of what their form of vanilla looks like. And then from there, we find themes and we tie threads between what they already desire or think about or wish they could try and how that might connect to their partner's kinks. God, you know, I mean, you really just touched on like some personal core things for me. I mean, I remember growing up and I remember the first time, so I mentioned earlier that I was in a, a kinky relationship, you know, 10 years ago or so. So when I was younger, I was very interested in like bondage and spanking and, and, you know, like maybe what people would term like light kink. I don't know. But I remember I was playing a game with some friends and, you know, it was, I don't know if you got caught, you got sent to jail. And I remember that I got caught and I got tied up and it was like this instant, like, oh, I, I like this. There was some weird visceral response that I had. And I remember like I kept getting caught so I could get tied up and uh, they would like put me in jail and then like game was over and they like want to take me out. I'm like, no, I'm good in here. Like just, I just remember that as a, as a young child having that response and feeling weird about it. And then I remember like reading a romance novel that was definitely too old for me. And there was this um, scenario where, you know, this bad prince called this woman a slut and spoke degradingly to her. And that also like kind of awakened something in me, right? And then I discovered I was, you know, into like kind of light kinky stuff and I enjoyed that. And then now as I'm older, I have found, <laughs> that I've become more and more vanilla as, you know, as time progresses. And now working in the porn industry, I feel almost ashamed, like you said, that I'm like so vanilla, you know, like I talk to all these people who have all these, you know, these wild sex lives and, you know, who shoot, you know, engage in porn for a living and da da da, da. And, you know, people expect that I'm crazy like this. And uh, what is this crazy shit you and your husband get up to? And I'm just like, I like missionary and like cuddles. <laughs> Shh, please don't tell anybody. <laughs> but like, like my tastes have changed. And for a long time, it, I like finally had to accept that I could, that it was okay that I changed, that my sexual preferences changed. Do you find that um, you deal sometimes with people who are going through the same thing? Like their sexual preferences change and it's kind of almost confusing for them. Absolutely. And that's why I bring a lot of sort of the physiological science and, and um, developmental psychology into my conversations when I talk to my clients about things, because that that's normal. Sex is a sensory thing. We all get that. We get that, you know, orgasms feel good and touch activates our touch receptors in our skin. And we understand that. But we don't think about the fact that our brains process all sorts of sensations in the same way. You mentioned, you know, the prince calling the woman a slut in a romance novel. The reason why degrading language turns some people on is because it activates the fight, flight, freeze response in the same way that a caveman seeing a tiger would. Our brain can't differentiate between different kinds of sensation. And so being called a name that we find degrading activates that same sort of adrenaline rush that we would get if we were in a dangerous situation. And for some people, adrenaline rushes feel good. And that ties directly into your question, because when we understand that everything is sensory, we understand that our body's responses to any kind of sensation is going to change as we age. One of the best examples I give is food. I have a friend that's a nutritionist, and when my son was little bitty, she said he needed to try, if there was a food he didn't like, I shouldn't force it. 
but I should reintroduce it about every 18 months because our skin cells turn over, our taste buds turn over, and we literally become more receptive to flavors that we might not have liked once before because our body has physically changed. As we age, our skin gets thinner and we become maybe less interested in impact play because it's more likely to hurt in a different way than it did when we were younger. Mm. When we kind of remove the value statement from the equation and just think about it from an, of course, this makes perfect sense. Our bodies are doing this in all kinds of ways all the time. Now we can start from a place of, well, this is normal. We all experience this. And instead of feeling bad about it, let's focus on, well, what do I enjoy right now that I might not have before? What might I be open to now that I wasn't five years ago? What are those new tastes that I rejected three years ago? Interesting. Yeah. That's that's interesting what you said about the skin getting thinner and the impact play, because I've definitely noticed that. Like I used to be able to take a beat and now I'm like, get away. (laughs) What are the most common sexual fantasies that you encounter that people tend to be ashamed of? Um, It's odd because the most common ones are also the ones that people are most embarrassed about. A lot of people have fantasies of dominance and submission. And people feel ashamed on both sides. People that want to explore dominance worry that maybe that means that they're a sadist or maybe that means that they're a narcissist, that somehow there's something wrong with them. And in a lot of ways, I blame the Fifty Shades book for that. I was going to ask you what your opinion on that book was, actually. (laughs) We'll get there. Um, But literally, (laughs) the title... Fifty Shades of Grey comes from a throwaway line in the book where he describes himself as Fifty Shades of Fucked Up. So you have this incredibly influential set of books that from the very title is conflating dominance with being fucked up. Mm. And you, you really do have a lot of people that worry that if they want to control their partner, if they want to play around with sensation play and see how their partner reacts to a spanking or a flogging, or if they know that they like how their partner reacts to a spanking and they want to try something deeper, they worry about what that says about them. And then the flip side, on the submissive side, we have women that are saying, well, I can't be a good feminist and a submissive. That's like betraying the cause. That's betraying the sisterhood. I can't make that choice for myself because somehow that's now a wrong choice. And we have men that are taught what it means to be a man is to be the authority figure, to be the proactive one. And how dare you? Like, what does it mean if you're this weird sissy that wants to be a submissive? Like, they bring a lot of cultural messages around what it means to be a man, what it means to be a woman. And that's incredibly confusing for people that maybe don't identify in one of those boxes quite so easily as well. And so we, we tend to think, especially when I'm doing like consultations with other therapists, they tend to assume that there's a category of people that do things they feel ashamed of. And what I have found is that almost anybody can find a way to feel embarrassed about what they want. And almost anyone, because we don't have a culture that teaches us that pleasure is okay and that pleasure is valuable and that it's okay to want to feel good, that that is a normal, healthy thing. Anything that we want simply because it feels good and is pleasurable for us, we have to somehow explain in a way that makes it wrong. And Mm. I don't really think that's fair to anyone. Right. So back to the Fifty Shades of Grey book. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Why do you think that that was such a sensation? Like, why did so many women respond in the way they did to the book? And what specifically about the book do you find was counterproductive to like the work that you've done around BDSM and kink? Uh, I would say all of it is counterproductive to the work that I've done around BDSM and kink. I do a tremendous amount of education for other mental health providers. And in a couple of different talks, including one that I do specifically on domestic violence, sexual assault, and kink, I present them with a case study. And I walk them through a handful of different examples of relationship behavior within a relationship. And I ask them, If your client were describing this to you, would you say that that's consensual kink or would you call that domestic violence? And consistently, and I can watch the reactions like, oh, yeah, that's not okay. Oh, that's definitely that's definitely domestic violence. Oh, my God. Why is she letting that happen? Like you can watch the reactions get more and more extreme as I walk them through the behavior examples. 
And at the end, I ask them if anybody recognizes my case study. And nobody ever does. And then I flip my slide and I tell them it's the Fifty Shades of Grey story. Every example I have comes directly from those books. And wow. the only time I ever use those books is to explain what domestic violence looks like when it's hidden in the guise of kink. Mm. So why do you think that it was such a, like, a sensation? Like, And specifically women were really, you know, I mean, every woman was raving about it. Like, you know, th there was this whole idea that it was helping women like unlock their, their kinky side, these housewives, you know, find the side to them that they didn't know existed or they were ashamed about. I wish I understood why those books were pop popular because, you know, as a writer myself, they're terribly written. They're incredibly <laughs> cringy. They're not an accurate <laughs> depiction of kink. And they're not even an accurate depiction of a healthy, like non-sexual relationship. But I think that there are certain things that hit like the zeitgeist at just the right time, right? Like Fifty Shades of Grey started out as Twilight fan fiction. I think a lot more people know that now than did then, but it literally was repackaging this already incredibly popular story <laughs> and layering on this like sexy over, over veneer. And so I think that there was something about that moment in time and I do think it was written in a way that felt less threatening to female readers. Uh, one of, for me, the cringiest aspects is the consistent like inner goddess monologue. My inner goddess did a tango. My inner goddess was like waltzing across the floor. My inner goddess was cheering. It's ridiculous and cringy and juvenile, but I actually think that's what made it palatable to female readers. It was because mm -hmm. it was taking these things that would never have been okay in another context. And when you layer on this silly little fluffy sort of artistry around it, now all of a sudden it feels a little bit safer because it can't possibly be problematic if it's this ridiculous too. And I think it was the combination of it hitting just the right moment in time of like the twilight moment and yeah. also the way it, it blended together this like really sort of immature dialogue around these really problematic scenarios that let people engage with some fantasies that they weren't necessarily comfortable with themselves but it wasn't so well written that they couldn't have plausible deniability. They could always say, you know, I mean, I know it's silly. I know it's juvenile. I know it's ridiculous. I can't help myself. I love it. Which lets them also kind of keep their kink desires at an arm's distance as well. It lets them explore it without having to fully own it and claim it. Oh, that's interesting. What do you think it is that sexually attracts people to pain? Um, there's a phenomenal book that I always recommend whenever anybody asks me this question. It's called Hurt So Good. And the author, whose name eludes me at this moment, and I will apologize to her for that, is a both a, a masochist and a former ballerina. And she compares the process of training to be a ballerina with the process of masochism, the pain that you go through. She talks about it as pain with purpose. And every chapter in the book looks at a different way in which we culturally embrace and explore and play with pain. Everything from, you know, tattoos to hot pepper eating contests to ultra, ultra marathoners that just run until they drop. And she really dives into the psychology of pain and what pain does for our bodies and our relationships. And she asks the question, why is it only in a sexual context that all of a sudden we have a problem with it? You know, mm. we'll watch people eat ghost, 500 ghost peppers and collapse and vomit. But if somebody likes to have clothespins on their nipples, now all of a sudden we're judging them. So I think that just understanding that pain releases endorphins in the body. And endorphins are morphine created by our body. That's what the name actually means. It's androgynous morphine. It's morphine created within the body. Mm. So when we think about the idea of like a runner's high, that's very similar to what people are getting when they play with pain. They are getting an endorphin rush that is literally an equivalent to morphine. And if we yeah. think about how addictive morphine is, all of a sudden now we understand why somebody might want a really solid paddling to get that same feeling. Right, right. Yeah, it's funny. My brother is an ultra runner. 
So he does like those hundred mile races. And to me, that's like way more bananas than like anybody I know who's, you know, been hung upside down and whipped and <laughs> had like a weight attached to their penis. <laughs> I would much rather do that than run hundred miles. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But for some reason, we judge some people and not others, even when we're all putting our bodies through the same amount of strain, just in different forms or for different reasons. Absolutely. In your book, you distinguish secrecy from privacy. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, I, I think that everybody has a fundamental right to privacy. Privacy is what lets us have healthy boundaries. <laughs> privacy is what lets us be differentiated as human beings and differentiated from our partners, differentiated from our parents. The ability to have things that are just ours and information and, and things that we like or that we desire or that we want that are just ours is always okay. Secrecy is to me a bit different because secrecy is when we are overtly withholding information. When we are not just saying, I don't want to show this to you, but we're going, well, look over there. I don't have anything at all. That's the difference. There's a difference between saying, yeah, I mean, I watch porn, but I don't really want to tell you what kind of porn I like. That feels private mm -hmm. to me. Versus mm -hmm. saying, no, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't watch porn. I would never watch porn. How could you ever suggest that I would? There's, mm. there's a difference between saying something about myself is just mine versus saying, I don't have anything there at all. Why are you asking? That's a good distinction. And you know, it's, it's funny. I, you know, cause I'm, I always take everything that I hear and I, you know, relate it back to my own personal experience, but, uh, you know, my husband, I know, watches porn because he's a man and he's certainly, you know, he, he will randomly know who certain porn stars are. And, you know, I'm not an idiot, but we've actually never talked about what kind of porn he watches. And I've jokingly asked him, but I've never, ever pushed him on it. And it doesn't like feel like something that I need to know. And it doesn't feel like something he wants to share with me. And I'm, I'm sure what he watches is actually, I'm not sure who knows. And it doesn't, but it doesn't make a difference to me, but I never thought about that as being a different between privacy and secrecy. But I guess like, ultimately I kind of realized that like, you know, intrinsically because I've just never, I've never pushed that question. But yeah, that makes sense. Privacy is a necessary element of healthy relationships. Secrecy gets in the way of it. Yeah. You mentioned that some of your favorite clients are ones who were raised in deeply religious homes who got married out of fear of eternal damnation for sex. Why do you enjoy these clients in particular and how do you counsel them? I love them because I come from a, a deeply religious faith background myself. I actually, um, my grandparents were evangelical ministers that traveled all around the world for their entire lives doing tent revivals and all sorts of stuff. I have very Pentecostal family. I also have very Jewish family. I spent five years studying to be a rabbi before I did my master's in social work. And so I love working with people that speak the language of religion because I love helping them sort of recontextualize their understanding of goodness, their understanding of godliness, their understanding of what their bodies were designed for and created to enjoy, and to let them stay who they are. I'm not somebody that's out to convert people away from their faith traditions, but I absolutely love being able to have people say, I never thought about the idea that if God didn't want sex to feel good, I mean, we could have just been designed for sex to not feel like anything. Like, why did right. God create the orgasm? Why is, why is my body capable of this pleasure? And to have those conversations. And then as somebody that walks, you know, between the worlds of like evangelical Christianity and observant Judaism, I really like challenging some of the cultural teachings, like people that believe that masturbation is sinful are often coming from one very specific faith interpretation of that. And I love being able to say, well, do you know what Jews think about that? Do you know what those stories and those verses mean in the context of like ancient Jewish tradition and culture and how that can change your perception of masturbation? Um, those conversations as somebody that, you know, once wanted to be a rabbi are just super fun for me. And I love being able to show people that sex can be faith affirming and that sex can be a holy act. So Stephanie, just to, to close our conversation out, what is the greatest misconception that you think people have about the kinky community and what 
would you like to see change? I think the biggest misconception is that the idea that kink is sexual. We, I, I think a lot of the stigma around BDSM and kink happens because people think of it as a sexual act when really it is a relational act. It is a way that people choose to find connection to one another. It is a way that people choose to build and structure their relationships with one another and to feel close and safe and connected and trusting and supported. And when all of that can happen with your clothes on. There are people that live vibrant, kinky lives that would I tell you they are a 24-7 lifestyle kinkster who are entirely asexual and might never take their clothes off with their partner. And that to me is the biggest thing that people need to understand is that this is a way of building relationship. And sometimes mm. sex is involved. <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> if you're lucky. Yeah, no, that's that's a good distinction. And that's something that, you know, I don't I don't hear too often either. So I appreciate I appreciate that insight. Well, Stephanie, thank you so much for joining us. This has been so interesting, so enlightening. Um, can you tell everybody where they can find you online, please? Uh, yeah, my author website is stephaniegorlick.com. And we just this week added uh, printable PDFs of all of the worksheets from the Sprinkles book. So those are there if anybody wants to go and peek at them. Uh, anybody that is interested in clinical work with me, my practice is Bound Together Counseling. And then my partner and I do a podcast and a conference talking about, um, speaking of privacy, the intersection of intimacy and technology and all the ways that technology informs our sexuality and our relationships today. And that is every week. It's called Securing Sexuality. And, and the live conference is um, October 19th and 20th here in Detroit. Fantastic. And you guys, of course, can find me online at Holly Randall on Instagram and on Twitter. Um, go to hollylinks.com for links to all of my social media profiles. And make sure that you go out and get Stephanie's book with sprinkles on top. Everything vanilla people and their kinky partners need to know to communicate, explore, and connect. Give her a follow on her socials. Drop her a line. Let her know that you heard her here on the podcast so she knows that her time was well worth it. Thank you guys so much for joining and I'll see you next week. <laughs>